Hello, and welcome back to the Thriftington Post. My name is Lantis, and today's episode is about World of Warcraft, patch 5.4. Now, keep in mind that nothing is finalized until it actually goes live, so anything is subject to change. But we're far enough into the PTR cycle now that I feel like a lot of what has gone into it will probably be showing up in live, just minus a few bugs here and there. But there are some things that... I'm still not sure of, like, the first thing is item upgrades. Now, Ghostcrawler has said in the past that there probably won't be Valor items available in patch 5.4. You won't be buying anything at all with Valor. It's just going to be used for item upgrades. And then he tweeted, well, maybe item upgrades won't be coming back in at all, after all. So we might not see them again because they're still trying to decide if they want to have a patch 5.5. We don't know if that's going to exist, and it's usually the small patch after the main raid patch where item upgrades come back. So if it doesn't come out with those, then we probably won't get, probably won't have them at all. Now, one reason why he might not want to bring them back is they've basically been used to nerf raids throughout this entire expansion. Like, the raid's out for a couple months, and then item upgrades come in, and now you can become however much stronger than it was possible to be for the first few months of the raid, just through upgrading items. And that has been working out really well, I think, because at this point, you actually feel like you're killing the boss. If you've been working on it all that time, you have the extra Valor stashed up, you have actual items from the raid itself, so now you can upgrade them. So it's something you're doing, and now the content's easier and completable, but you feel like you did it. You don't feel like Blizzard beat the boss for you because they just said, well, now everything is 10, 15, 20% easier. But since this is the last raid tier, it's very likely that they're going to put back in the progressive raid nerf like they did with ICC and Dragon Soul. So Siege of Org is going to come out, and then a couple months later, they're going to put in the 5% nerf, and then every two weeks, it'll go you know 10%, 15 20 And if they do this, then there's no reason for the item upgrades. So that could be what happens. But, you know... This isn't the first time they were just going to have exclusively the item upgrade and then pulled it back in exchange for Valor buying gear again. When Missa Pandaria was going to launch initially, you know, 5.0, that was supposed to have, or 5.0 might have been the pre-patch. But anyway, whenever MOP was going to launch, they were just going to have item upgrades. Like, Ghostcrawler wanted to do something completely different with Valor in this expansion, and that was his big idea. But then item upgrades weren't ready in time for it to launch, so it got delayed until 5.1. But also, another thing that's sort of going back on an earlier thing they said is that Justice Points will buy epics again in patch 5.4. At least as of right now, they are. It's when one of their stated design goals for MOP was that players would actually have to progress through every tier of raiding in MOP in order to get to the last raid. Even if you're just a casual guy running LFR, you'd have to do tier 14, get gear from there to do 15 to do finally get into 16. And now with patch 5.4, they are doing away with that by just letting you go back and buy all the old Valor items with Justice Points. Also, they're reducing the rep required to buy those from the rep vendors. So I believe it's everything that you could get at Revered before is now going down to Honored, whereas Exalted staying the same. So if you had to be Exalted for something, those rewards are untouched. And... This is going to make gear, gearing up for Siege of Org a lot easier, but it also means you'll very likely be able to skip through tier 14 and 15. Maybe doing, yeah, maybe doing them once just for a couple things here and there, like a, to get a decent trinket or just to see if you get lucky and get some loot. But then you're basically moving straight on up to tier 16. It'll be, you know, one week worth of progression versus several months of progressing through gear just to get to Siege of Org. And I actually like 
that because, I don't know, I guess I started playing, like, really raiding in World of Warcraft too late. So I wasn't very serious about raiding until Wrath of the Lich King, where starting at Trial of the Crusader, you didn't need to do the previous tiers at all. You could just jump straight on up to whatever the most recent tier is after running a handful of heroics. And now we're back to that again. And speaking of Wrath, we're going to be back to Wrath heroics of the easiest, most base roll heroics imaginable to get very good epics, and then you jump into the last tier of rating because there aren't going to be any new heroics released with 5.4, so we're still going to be doing the 5.0 heroics, and anyone that's been raiding Throne of Thunder at all should be able to solo those dungeons at this point. Now, you wouldn't want to because you don't get Valor at the end of it unless you queue in with a group, but if you're fast enough, you can outpace the group and just run on ahead and kill everything so that the other party members don't get in your way. And I actually think that's a terrible design there, but it's what I've been having to do lately. Because other people just mean that they're going to pull stuff that you can't tank as a DPS, and you're trying to kill everything at a pace that you can kill it without it being able to kill you, and so it's just a mess whenever other people are there. But I don't know what I'm getting at here. I forgot what I was saying again. I do that sometimes. But still, yeah. Okay, Heroics, their face roll, it's easier to solo them than to deal with other people as long as you have Throne of Thunder gear. And if you're coming in fresh, well, I guess you would still rely on at least there being a tank and pillar present to get your alt up to a tier 16 standard in a timely manner. But speaking of Blizz and commentary on their design decisions, uh, this is where the spoiler warning comes in, because I'm going to mention something about the Klaxi in a second, so if you care at all about the story... Well, anyway, people have really hated the design of dailies in Miss of Pandaria, and in Patch 5.4, Blizzard... I don't know if Blizzard themselves decided that it was a bad design and needed to die, or if they're mad that players were mad about them, or if they're doing this for the players as sort of a way for everyone to experience a catharsis over seeing all the dailies obliterated. Now, I don't know they're not actually obliterated. They're still there in some form or another, but the quest hub for the Golden Lotus is getting wiped off the map, and also the Klaxi, if you remember doing their dailies, you'll be killing all the main Klaxi Paragons in Siege of Org. So those people that have been giving you dailies and helping you out in Dread Waste, they're all gonna go. So, yeah, that's Scorched Earth. That is a Scorched Earth approach to dailies, just wiping off the, all the main quest givers from the map. So that is going to be really interesting, and I really hate that we have to kill the Klaxi, I'm afraid to admit, because I was fond of them. Like, one of them let me jump really high, and another one, like, would fly down occasionally and hit things, and I thought that was neat. I mean, I'm mad at the dailies. I'm not mad at the bugs, but, you know, storyline-wise, the old god that they worship is coming back in one form or another, so they are siding with him. I was really hoping that that was an allusion to a future expansion where we'd have to be fighting old gods or doing whatever, and the Klaxi would come back again and defend, like, maybe other old gods. Maybe they'd side with Nazoth in a future expansion where we finally deal with him. But, no, it was the exact old god that made all the Shah and Pandaria. They're siding with him now that Garrosh has abducted him and sap in his power. But still, so the Klaxi won't be coming back in a future expansion because we're taking care of all of them now. Oh well, but at least if we get to see the end of their story. Like, mop has been really good about that, actually. If you follow the story while questing, and then at the end it all seems to push you towards those dailies, and now in this patch you get to see sort of the death note of most of the daily hubs.
but besides the Klaxi, there are other bosses. All of the Klaxi count as one boss in the Siege of Org, which has 12 bosses, and it will be split into four parts, but uh, for the LFR, and also for flex rating, which that's another thing coming in 5.4, flex rating. But I've already spoken about that in more depth in a previous episode, which you can check out if you want to hear more about it. But still... I was looking at the dungeon journal, and everything seemed to be sectioned off into groups of four, so I was really hoping for this raid. We, w we would just have the Terrace of Endless Springs experience, where you do four bosses at a time. That's also what Dragon Soul was, four than four. And for this, it would be four, four, and four. But now it's looking like they're just going to do three, 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 three. Which, mm, it's just... The difference there would be, if you're a DPS, you would have four different hour-long queue times, plus a second four-hour-long queue time whenever you get a partial run. For This would be a total of eight hours in the queue if you're unlucky, just to finish it all, versus six hours if it was just three sections. So mm, That's why I was really hoping that it would be sectioned off into four bosses at a time. But, oh well. That, at least to have a bunch of healers, so it'll be easier for them to get through LFR because they don't have to wait. Or, well, I could also do flex rating, but I don't think with flex rating and LFR it's an either or. I think that really if you're the type that just does LFR, you're also going to want to do, if you're the type that just does flex rating, I meant to say, you're also going to want to do LFR because you know, that would be that many more chances each week to get gear. And it already takes a decent amount of time to get one character geared up in a tier. So you would want to take every opportunity you could. Now, another change coming with 5.4 is the elimination of at least the requirement of arena teams. on the P So on the PvP side of things, arena teams are going away. And... Now, I don't know if the teams themselves will disappear or if you're just no longer required to have them because I know they're saying that the final titles will be going based on your own personal MMR. But could you still have arena teams or do those just disappear and you could just queue up if you're with one other person or two other or four other to do you know 2v2, 3v3, and 5v5? And the reason I'm thinking and sort of hoping that they do keep the teams around. One is because I have a really cool team called Crush, Kill, Destroy, Swag that I don't want to see that team just disappear. And two is that 2v2 would once again award the Gladiator title and all the other titles if they just have the... if they award you based on your MMR at the end of the season, like your own personal rating... If that's what your awards go off of, then does this bring 2v2 back? If it's personal, how would they know the difference between if you've been getting your MMR up through 2s or 3s or 5s? Or would it just track differently for all three? Because, I mean, that's another thing they could do, and then it would work. Like, your personal 2s rating, your personal 3s, your personal 5s. So... We'll have to wait and see how that goes, but otherwise this is a really good change because I never do arena with the same people twice. At least it doesn't seem like I do twice in a row. I'll do it with one friend one week, and then basically I'm just grabbing whoever's online whenever I'm ready to conquest cap. And I don't, you know, I've never really worried that much about the rating. I'll just grab one or two other people if two people are on that also want conquest. Then I'll grab them. We'll go in cap off but so every week we have to figure out who's leader of the team then I have to figure out who I want to boot from the week before to get these people in I have to look at the rating if the rating's too high then I wouldn't want to start booting people from it and that can you know because they might actually be wanting to keep that team to get a title at the end of the season like my threes team started to get a decent high rating so then whenever I just wanted to conquest cap, I didn't want to do it on my threes team. So if more than one person wanted to do arena with me, but not four other people, so we couldn't do fives, then I would you know, have to either run with each of them one at a time or... Uh, so that was really just a mess. So if this is... But 
if this is really going off my own personal rating, I don't care if my MMR tanks. I've already got the achievements for several of the arena titles, so I'm not that eager to get them again. I mean, I'm really more the type of the person that likes achievements. I don't care about maintaining those achievements from season to season. So this would let me just invite however many people I want to do arena with me and not have to worry about anyone else that would want to be doing arena. Though now that I think about it, you could actually game the system pretty easily with this. If you have um, if you're just doing arena steadily with the same team, and then several people tank, you know, just leave team up, tank their rating, then join back with the other person, then you'd get much easier teams while that person's MMR stays high. And then whenever the teams start getting hard enough to require CC again, then you could tank, you have those other two people leave, tank their rating again. And well, this isn't supposed to be a show about exploits, so I'm going to stop there, but that's just a thought that I had, like, right now, so I wanted to see it through, and I can't see anything wrong with doing this. I mean, I can see something wrong with it, but I mean, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. Hmm. Maybe I should delete that part. Eh, forget it. I'm sure they'll figure this out and patch it, because they've already said that they're considering... Well, what if someone just invites you at random and then queues up? So you're like, oh, I didn't want to do Arena, and you leave. But because you queued up, and if the thing popped instantly, like if someone else invited you, queued for twos, it's going to pop immediately, and there you go. Your rating's going to go down because you weren't ready to do Arena. You had no idea you are about to do Arena. So they said, oh, well, we're looking into this, and we're going to put some sort of fail-safe measure in to make sure that doesn't work. Maybe they've anticipated the other thing also. Hmm. But anyway, uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about for patch 5.4 are class changes. Not all the class changes, but just some, just a few in particular that have been a point of controversy. One is the, the first one is the Kill Jaden's Cunning change. For Warlocks, they had their level 90 talents, one talent that was, that everyone took basically. It was, they had Kill Jaden's Cunning, which is the one that is getting changed. And right now on PTR, it's still like... Before, what it did is it lets you do all of your spells while moving, but it just applied first a 15 and then a 30% movement impairing effect. So you're moving 30% slower if you're just running around casting for uh, the debuff last like 6 seconds. And then the other two is Manoroth's Fury, which increases the area of your area of effect attacks, and Archimon's Vengeance, which deals damage back to whatever hits you. Well, naturally, every Warlock took Kill Jaden's Cunning, unless they hadn't read the tooltips and they were just Christmas treeing their talents. They would take Kill Jaden's Cunning because being able to do all your damage while moving is very nice. But it was too nice, and Blizzard said they did not want to make any talent mandatory. So now they're going back through all the talents and taking all the really good ones that everyone likes and having to nerf them down because they just don't want to make anything mandatory. In some cases, like for Resto Shamans, this meant making, what was it, Healing Tide Totem baseline for all Shamans. So now Shamans just have that and now they'll put something else there. So there's no longer one mandatory talent on a particular tier and it becomes more of a choice. But for Kill Jaden's Cunning, that was a little too strong to make it baseline. So instead of making it baseline, they are changing how it works. The first, Their first thought was to make it just like Spirit Walker's Grace, an activated ability. And then they said, well, what if we make it a passive ability again, but it only works for certain spells, which the certain spells were Incinerate, I want to say Maleficent Grasp for Affliction, and for... Demo it with Shadow Bolt. So just for those abilities, you can do those while moving. No more, no more snare effects, so no more slowing down while you cast them. You can run around and do those abilities, but you have to stop for everything else. And also, they're going to try to buff the other two abilities so that they're the better choice in fights where there's not a lot of movement. And then that would get back to their design philosophy for the current incarnation of talents. 
But right now, the last time I checked it, it looked like it was back to being like Spirit Walker's Grace, but without a cooldown. So that's bizarre. I am I really don't think that's what they're going live with. I think what they're going live with was the previous thing I'd mentioned. But I don't know. I'm still watching that. And either way, I don't really like this change too much with um, Kill Jaden's Cunning. I didn't like it because Canrathad felt like he would be impossible if I couldn't do all my damage while moving. So other Warlocks that are getting up and only have like a 480 item level, because that's what did I have. I had 486 when I beat him. So if you have that low of item level, you're already doing so little damage that you're having to do something weird to get through the fight using a vanilla well potion just to remove the basic basically sort of enrage timer he curses you and after seven minutes you die there's a you can use a purification potion which has been all but removed from the game because like no one uses it for anything anymore except for this but Anyway, you use that and it removes the timer, and then he recasts it, and then you have seven more minutes. So time it right, and the fight's like 14 minutes. Well, it's more like 15 and a half because he doesn't cast it right away, the first one right away. But still, you're just barely skirting the edges of that 15-minute timer to kill him as it is. Now, if all of your damage goes to... If, if all of your damage is can only be done while standing still. So now every time you move to do anything, like to line him up with the big pit lord, or why else would you move? I guess you can stand in his reign of fire as long as you keep his debuffs off you. But anyway, that's going to make that fight so much harder. But also, this change will be happening in tier 16, and valor items will be sold for justice points. So maybe warlocks will just be able to outgear it to the point that that doesn't even matter anymore, and even if you're just standing still, you can kill them well within the initial seven minutes. I don't know. But either way, I, I feel like something would be... Anytime Warlock gets changed, I feel like something is lost from that fight because that tends to make it a little easier. Like, whenever they made it so that your lock portal could be used more often, I thought, man, that's going to make that fight a lot easier because now you can keep them on your pit lord easier. But I am getting sidetracked here. So the other change I wanted to, the other class change I wanted to bring up was the hunter readiness change, which this is, well, this is just a another one of those weird things. It doesn't have to do with talents, but there is one hunter talent change, which I'm actually going to talk about before the readiness change. It's the silent shot talent. Every not every hunter, but more hunters than not take Silencing Shot because you need an interrupt. Most classes just need an interrupt for just about anything. And the other two talents, right now it's Intimidate, it used to be Binding Shot, and the other ones, I don't know because I never use it. Silencing Shot, however, is being taken out basically, I think entirely, or maybe they're giving it back to Marksman only. But either way, it's... they're taking it out, or likely going to take it out, because, you know, this isn't final until it goes live. And instead of having silencing shot, you'll have, you'll be able to use scatter shot as an interrupt. And this is good news if you're doing arena against a hunter, bad news if you're doing arena as a hunter, because right now you can silencing shot one person and then turn and scatter someone else and then freezing trap them. Yeah, you don't have to scatter trap someone to get them frozen. You can do the disengage with the web thing, but what if you like one of the other two disengages? I mean, you'd be wrong about it, but this would just make the webbing disengage mandatory for Arena, wouldn't it? But, I mean, Blizzard was saying as long as you're not using the same talents for every situation, then they won't consider a mandatory. So if it's mandatory in PvP but not in PvE then they don't care as much. So, yeah, I guess that wouldn't run counter to their design philosophy. But I'm saying a lot of words here, and I'm not giving very good context for them. Uh, back on track, though. This is going to be terrible, because they've already taken away Intimidate as a 
baseline Beastmaster CC. And what I used to love about Beastmaster is how you could get people trapped in CC for almost ever. Now, yeah, that was OP, and I openly admitted it was OP back then. But whenever you could intimidate someone, then interrupt them with scatter, then interrupt them with silence, and then readiness, and interrupt them with intimidate, scatter, silence, that would be such a long chain of CC that you could crush anyone 1v1. They didn't stand any chance at all against you. And that was really amazing. But now we're going from those three things, readiness, do them again, to you have one scatter shot, so you better make it count. And that's it. And scatter shot's going to be both still a scatter shot and a silence. It's... Actually, they're, I mean, they're adding a glyph that makes scatter shot and interrupt. So you're also giving up one of your glyphs to use it as a silence. But if you're going to use it as a silence against players, well, it already silences players because it um, disorients them. So I don't know why you would turn it into an interrupt unless it also lowered the cooldown. Hmm. I mean, yeah, use it in a raid situation, and that's what they're trying to do is nerf them in PvP without nerfing them in PvE. So that answers my own question. But it's just weird seeing such a long, brutal CC chain become just one single thing. That does strike me as over-nerfing them, because they've already removed Intimidate, so that was gone from there. And that brings me to the readiness chain change, which is making it so that readiness barely resets anything. It reset... Uh, right now it resets all of... Right now it resets everything except for Stampede. But they're going to make it so it doesn't reset attacks, it doesn't reset Bestial Wrath, so Beastmasters, Beastmaster Hunters will no longer have the Triple Trinket. And yeah, I did think that that was a little OP, but I mean, they're losing Triple Trinket and a massive chain of CC at the same time. So, mm. but I mean, maybe, and I hate to say this, maybe they deserve to be over nerfed because they were overly OP for a long time. But whenever you remove readiness, resetting attacks, then that is going to make their rotation even simpler because their rotation's already been being simplified over time. And right now you at least have to time readiness to be able to do, every, do all your damage, then hit readiness and do it all again at just the right time to do the maximum possible damage. And removing readiness from resetting all that, which of course they'll be compensated in other places to make them, you know, to not make them just a weaker class, because right now they are balanced around being able to do that. But whenever you... S but removing readiness from resetting that will simplify their DPS rotation, and that's what I was trying to get to there. They'll be even more simplified than they are now, because right now they're basically pop all your cooldowns, and then spam Arcane Shot, and Kill Command, and Dire Beast. Is there anything else? Glaive Toss. But Still, I'm just worried that if they keep simplifying Beastmaster, and you could say, oh, well, this is a big nerf, they're probably not going to nerf them anymore, but they've been nerfing them along and along. They already changed Bestial Wrath, this expansion, from being a CC immunity on the pet to just a CC breaker, and I mentioned Intimidate several times because I'm irritated about that. You know, it used to be the Beastmaster signature move was Intimidate. Whenever they came up with the class specialization incarnation in Cataclysm where you pick a specialization and they immediately give you an ability that's like the signature of that class. Intimidate was the Beastmaster signature ability. And now because it's a talent, you can be a Beastmaster without what was at one point considered the Beastmaster signature ability. And I think that's really weird. And this has completely sidetracked me and I don't remember what I was getting at now. Oh, oversimplification of Beastmaster. I think that the spec is in danger of becoming old Arcane Mage 2.0. Like, back in the day when Arcane Mage was do nothing but spam Arcane Blast, Beastmaster is going to be do nothing but spam Arcane Shot. So the word's even the same. So this danger should be present in some people's minds somewhere that Beastmaster has been simplified way too much and that they do all their damage with one button. And it will just be that, because so far, every time they're nerfed, they make either Aspect of the Hawk stronger, which is just a passive buff, you know, you hit the button and you forget about it, and they make Arcane Shot stronger. 
they do one or the, one of the two. They make Arcane Shock stronger, or they make Aspect of the Hawk stronger. So, yeah, all their damage is just going to be coming from that one attack, plus the other three, which or the other three which are all on cooldowns, and you just sort of hit them as they come up. There's no skill involved in that. It's just hit what lights up, like old Ret Pally. So they're going to be Wrath of the Lich King Ret Pally plus Wrath of the Lich King Arcane Mage, where they're just hit what lights up plus spam this one button. And I guess com I guess Blizzard's thinking that combining those two makes it just complicated enough that people wouldn't call it face roll, but I still would, so... I don't know. But I believe that just about wraps things up for today. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment below, or you can contact me on Twitter, Atlantis Armstrong. That's L-E-N-T-I-S-A-R-M-S-T-R-O-N-G. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you later.